We should all text Jackie and Travis right now. They're probably in church. Their phone would just blow up. It'd be great. I'm going to read a selection out of Romans 7. I'm going to jump around so you can follow me on the slides. That's probably the best way to do it. Paul says, I don't really understand myself. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, that's right. For I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Um, I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It's the sin living in me that does it. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You read it like that, you catch. I call that Paul's tongue twister. When you read it like that, you really, you're like, dude, he was messed up, right? <laughs> Paul and me, we're the same, man. You have something in common with an apostle, man. That's good. I, um, I read a book several years ago, not a Christian book, by a guy named Jeff Olson called The Slight Edge. And in the book, he, he just kept raising this question, why do we keep doing things that get what we don't want, you know? Like, I want to be skinny, but I keep choosing to be fat. <laughs> I want to have more money, but I keep choosing to be broke, you know? And sometimes it's that way with God. In fact, I got a little, I got, can you put up my Garfield? I love Garfield. Any other Garfield people? In the, house? the other brother's like, I don't know who Garfield is. Shame on you. <laughs> Jesus still loves you, but it's harder. No, I'm just kidding. John buys a new hat. What do you see what I bought, Garfield? Big, amazing hat. Who has that hat? Raise your hand if you have that hat. Okay. Garfield's closing line, it's amazing the things people would rather have than money. So that's a, that's a great comic right there. Why do we choose things that we don't really want in life? And life is a, a continual lesson, learning to choose the small things that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. That's kind of what life is, what we are trying to do with our life, make those right choices that move us forward so we also want to move closer to God but we often choose distance over closeness don't we and so today is about choosing closeness today's title is new habits and I'll be honest there may be parts of this that aren't for you and this isn't going to come across like you think the title is I have a, a different approach I'm going to take here surprise shock I tend to do that. And uh, so when we come at this idea of new habits, I just, I just want to kind of start by presenting this possibility. Today we're talking about working on the real you. The real you. The one that Jesus died on a cross to save. The one that Jesus lives with inside of you. The real you. Not the you that you present to the world. Not the you that's hiding behind a mask and that's trying to portray something. I know about that version of me and of you, okay? That isn't the one Jesus died for. That person will die. But there is a real you that God believes is valuable, that God cares about, that God wants to be with, that you're afraid to know, most of you. You are afraid to actually come to know yourself. And so today is about moving in that direction that that inner person becomes something else. In ordinary faith, we like to present this framework all the time. We start by trusting Jesus. We live to honor God, and we grow by helping others. Another way I could state that and fit in that framework is this. We need Jesus. Amen? Amen. Two, we can change because we have been changed in the truest version and deepest person of ourselves. Jesus changed us when we trusted him. So we need Jesus. We can change. And third, we have a mission. If you're walking through life without a purpose, that is not for you. God has a purpose for you. Your life is a message to the world. And so our task is to find that. And so when we talk about Christian disciplines a lot of times, we're talking about bringing those things before God, letting God work on those things in our life. That's the purpose of Christian discipline, so to speak. And so discipline in our lives begins to look like choosing the things that 
we need now that are going to do things for us. It's like choosing between what we want now and what we need the most. I have this little thing I, I, I use a lot. I don't know if it's catching on yet, but I'm going to keep trying. I call them simple, repeatable actions. I've worked in corporate America. I've worked in not corporate America. I've worked for people. You know, I've, I've done all, I've worked in churches some even. Um, and I have spent so much of my life working on some kind of strategy or a plan to get things done. And this is something I've noticed about myself and humanity and definitely corporations. They definitely drift toward complication. W- wouldn't you say that? I mean, you guys that are working for companies or the government or something like that, don't you just love, they call it the, the red tape. Don't you just love it? When there's so much red tape, you can't do the right thing. That's To me, that's one of the deepest problems with our country. When you can't do the right thing because of the rules, something is broken, you know. But that's a sermon for another time. That's not my point. That was me venting. (laughs) Thank you. I needed the therapy. (laughs) I'm better now. I call them simple, repeatable actions. I was in my men's group on Tuesday, and uh, the Lord gave it to me this way. Someone had, I can't remember what we were talking about. I was talking to Bruce Snowberger, or as I like to call him, Bruce Snowberger, and uh, <clears throat> just just kidding. And I and this is what came out. I think it was of the Lord. It's so much that I remembered it, and I never remember anything I say. So it was like the simple things that get done will beat complicated plans that never get applied any day of the week. And that's what we do. A lot of times we spend a lot of time planning and figuring out, and no time actually applying. So I am a fan of simple, and here's why. Simple gets done. Simple gets done. So my life, I live now a life of routines, man. I am a habitual creature, man. I drive to the senior center every time I come the exact same way. My son's been driving me lately, and he's been doing it wrong. (laughs) And it's been bugging me, okay? I am a creature of habit. And, and part of that is out of necessity, man. I can't remember stuff. I don't know if I'm getting old or dumb or both, but I can't remember stuff. So if I don't get something in my routine, it isn't going to get done. So just know that. If you want me to get something done that's out of my routine, routine, tell that amazing wife of mine, you're wasting your breath telling me, okay? So I want to ask this question as we get into this this new life, the new expectations, the new habits of a new life. I want to ask this question, and I don't want you to answer it just yet because there's a hook in it, and I don't want you to get caught by it. But I want you to ask yourself, what is it that you really want in this life? What is it that you really want in this life? Now, don't answer it yet because I want to put some caveats on this, okay? First one is 1 Peter 2.11. In 1 Peter 2.11, Peter makes this bodacious statement it just has always blown me away bodacious yeah i brought that back from the 90s any hank jr the third anyway so i grew up in tennessee what can i say dear friends i warn you i warn you does that sound serious when you say to your kids i am warning you okay i warn you as temporary residents and foreigners Keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Wage war against your very souls. Think about that. Let that soak in for a second. There's stuff in this life that comes from our culture, that comes through the media, that comes from other people, that's literally, in Peter's language, waging war on us. So when I ask you, what is it you really want in this life? Remind yourself, I cannot let my culture and my world determine what I want. I can't do that. If I do that, I'm setting myself up to be taken down. So if you're sitting there and I ask the question, what do you want, what do you need in this life? And your answers were things like, I need money, I need things, I need fame, I need a relationship. If it was anything that dies with you, if it was anything that dies with you, it's the wrong thing. Okay? You need more than that. Does that make sense? Hang on. There's more coming. This is going to get fun, but right now I've got to drive this base home, this foundation, okay? 
This thing, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the answer to your question, and I'm sorry about that. I know it's like, my mom used to do that. She would say, what are you doing? And then she would tell me what I was doing. Listen to Psalm 37. This is my favorite psalm. If you, I, I love a lot of the psalms, but Psalm 37, that's one of my favorites. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. Let me tell you what it is you really want. You really want communion. I know that doesn't sound like a good answer when, they're, when the money's short or when you have disease in your family or when your marriage is on the brink. But I'm here to tell you that what you really want is communion with the God who's over all of that. And that's what the writer of Psalms, David, is trying to tell us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will give you the desires of your heart. That is a double-edged sword. He will put the desires of your heart in you and he will fulfill those desires that he gave you is what he's saying. And so that, I just want to say, there may be a lot of things on your list and you hear me say all the time, there are a lot of questions in life but I believe there's only one answer and it's Jesus Christ. And this is why what we really need is communion with God. That's why Paul said to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing was not about you requesting stuff from God all day long nonstop. Pray without ceasing was about being in continual communion with God. Now, if you're sitting there going, I don't think I can do that, you can't. But Jesus lives in you. You are Holy Spirit powered. And so now you can. That make sense? You still with me? I had, this is all introduction. Let's get into sermon, okay? Let's get into actually what I want to talk, the, where we want to go with this. So we laid a foundation of what we want. So how are we going to get it? How are we going to get this this exciting, vibrant Christian faith in our life. How are we going to do there? So today's message really only has two points and 37 subpoints, but only two points. First point, we got to wake up. We got to wake up. Everybody say wake up. wake up. Who didn't say wake? Someone didn't say it. Someone says, I don't talk in church. We got to wake up. You cannot live life on autopilot. I used to, I'm trying to get out of it now, but I used to really love Zombie movies. It was one of my vices. And I'll, I'll t- you know, I'll tell you why I, I love zombie movies. First of all, I know in this room there are some people preparing for the zombie apocalypse. No hands up. No hands up. I just, I just want to say, chances are you're going to be a zombie, so maybe you should practice something else. All right. That's all I'm going to say about that. So, why, why is it that I like zombie movies? That is so unchristian of you. I, maybe so. But here's the reason. Because I live in a world where everybody is an automatic. Everybody's on autopilot. People don't live. Come on, man. People don't live. They just go through the motions until they die. They survive until they die. And that stinks. So the first thing that's got to happen in this new life of Jesus Christ and part of coming to faith is waking up. Realizing I am a living, breathing creation of the Most High God. I am not here by an accident. I'm not a mess. I'm not a wreck. I'm not stupid. I'm not a fool. I am appointed. I am planned. I have purpose. God wants me here. Wake up to that reality. Just wake up. So we start right there, waking up, snapping out of it, coming into this life. And let me ask this question. When is the last time... You felt inspired. Inspired. Now, I'm not talking about a vacation. <laughs> That's just being inspired because you don't have to go to work. Actually, a vacation really is, in our culture today, a vacation has become another consumable product. And that makes me angry that I live in a world that turns everything into a consumable. But again, that's another sermon, another talk, more on an unpopular side of things. I'm talking about when is the last time you felt inspired? Like breaking out, like something different, like you felt alive. That's what I mean. So how do we get there? How do we wake up? How do we feel inspired? So I want to share, I think Jesus has a little bit to teach us here. Now before I get into Jesus, let me ask you a question. i got to lay a foundation about Jesus 
I have to, I've asked this question a lot lately, and I'm going to keep asking it until everybody gets it. You have to ask the, answer this question about Jesus. Was Jesus an exception, or was Jesus an example? Was he an exception, or was he an example? You have to answer that question. Because if he's an exception to all the rules, and he says to us, you have to take up your cross and follow me. You have to lay down your life and die to yourself and follow me. That's unfair, right? If Jesus is the exception to all the rules, and he asks us to follow him, how can we? And so, is he an exception or is he an example? Obviously, I believe he's an example. Okay, now, I may have set you up there and going, well, obviously, I know where he's coming from. Yes, I am coming there. I think Jesus is an example. So, John 5, 19, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. That should strike you. That moves Jesus out of the exception category and into him doing something else. He lived this life as an example of what it means to follow God everywhere. So, I can do nothing by myself. He does only what he sees the Father doing, and whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. Why does God show Jesus everything he's doing? Because he loves the Son. Are you a son or a daughter? Does he love you? Is he showing you stuff? Says he is. Now, I might be missing it. He says he's showing. Jesus says his father's showing him stuff. How did Jesus do this? So it's real simple. It's not complicated. Jesus had this thing in his life he did. A lot of people would think it was weird, but he didn't care. And it was prayer. Here's how Jesus did it. We find out as we read the Gospels that Jesus spent a lot of nights, and he would sit up late in prayer. And then a lot of mornings, he would get up early, and he would pray. Now, what was he doing? He was connecting with his father at night, and he was connecting with his father in the morning. He was finding out what his father wanted him to do. He was looking for God at work. He was being in connection and communion with his father as each day as he knew more and more what his father was like, do you think it would have been more easy for him or more simple for him to see where God is working as he learns what his father is like? So Jesus spent time with God. Let me point out one little, cap, one little thing here I think is interesting. It really is kind of off topic, but I don't care. I want to share it with you. When God created the heavens and the earth, he concluded each day with a statement. Everything was good. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Have you ever thought about that? The Hebrew mind, based on creation, believes that the day starts at night. And I know you may sit there going, well, that's a little weird. It's no weirder than our day starting at midnight. Think about it. Our day starts at 1201. That's kind of stupid. I don't know who dreamed that up, but I wasn't on that committee. <laughs> Thank God. <clears throat> Science teaches us that, well, they discovered that the things that you go to bed on are the things that your brain will drive deep and process the most thoroughly as you sleep. So I'm just saying it's possible Jesus was teaching us how to drive the life of God deeper into our minds and into our hearts by spending late nights with his father and early mornings with his father. Now, prayer may be an intimidating thing, but I still want to encourage you to imitate Jesus and learn to pray. And I want to say, start where you are. You don't have to be amazing at prayer. You don't have to feel comfortable with it. You don't have to break out into King James when you do it. That used to really freak me out. You ever been talking to one of those deacons, you know, and they're like, yeah, man, I was watching the baseball game, and then someone asks them to pray in church, and they go, oh, Lord God in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. It's, we'll talk about that in our next series. But anyway, so, <clears throat> so it's, I just want to say start where you are. Just start where you are in prayer. Obey the impulses to pray. They're there in believers. Obey the impulses to pray. Obey the outreach of God through you. Start learning to obey in the little stuff. And the little, prayer is not little, but it's a simple place to start. 
I used to, I used to have this question of God. Because I, I grew up, um, I, I love the stories of the missionaries and the people who've given up so much for Jesus. And I used to ask myself, um, God, I'd ask God, God, how do I know I will be faithful if I'm ever persecuted or I'm ever put to the test? And here's what I've learned over the years. That if someone is faithful in the small things, then big things won't be a problem. If God can reorder your life now, getting you up early to spend time with him, if he can reorder your life through bringing you to prayer or bringing you to a community, if God can reorder your life because he's that important, then standing faithful in the time of persecution will not be a problem. So work on the little things. Start with praying. Praying is so powerful. Jesus prayed so much that it impressed his disciples. And that is our next series. We start next week. It's called Pray Like Jesus. I didn't even mean to do that plug, but there you have it, okay? Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 12, he says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Jesus said, his disciples are going to do greater works. Now, uh, i got, I got to do this. This is a little ornery. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask for forgiveness ahead of time. You don't have to give it, but it's okay. I just want to remind you that this is to a group of guys that 12 of them he empowered to go out and heal disease, cast out demons, and prepare the way of the Lord. And then later, another 72 come along, total 72 come along, he empowered them to do the same thing. We don't even know who they were. I'm just saying that when Jesus was on earth, that he gave this ministry of world-changing strength and power to these at least 72 guys to go out and, and prepare the way of the Lord through miraculous, through love, through all these kinds of things. And I just want to say, a lot of folks would argue, well, that's just the way he inaugurated the church into being. And I'm just going to say, he said you're going to do greater things than these. I think there is untapped power in the church today to destroy the works of hell. And I believe it's in you, and I believe it can be done. I, I believe God's going to do some stuff. Amen. Amen. Thank you. One person's excited about that. No, no, I'm just, I'm just picking. I just, I just want to drive that home. Greater things. Now, so we got to wake up. So we wake up through prayer. How do we pray? We clean up. Yeah, you'll see the system work here in just a second. This, this outline will be memorable to some degree. We have to clean up. What's that about? It's about confession of sin. Now, this might be an unpopular subject for you, but actually sin's very popular, I found. <laughs> Most people want to be delivered from temptation, but would like it to keep in touch, like leave a forwarding address or something like that. <laughs> Let me give you this passage out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, because I want God's people to be used by God. Do you want to be used by God? Yeah. Would you like to be used by God? Yeah. How many of you would really like to be used by God? Okay, sorry. All right. How many of you, oh, let's go this way. <clears throat> How many of you have people in your life that you want God to set free from something? Yes. All right. That's right. So how do we get there? 2 Timothy 2, 21. Look at this. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. And enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. What is Paul telling Timothy? If you want God's power to flow through you, you've got to get the junk out of you. This isn't about earning anything with God. I want to stand here right now and let you know that the moment you trusted Jesus, you were given a righteousness that was not your own. Legally, before God, you are good to go. This isn't about worth. This is about being used. And this isn't about God standing back going, well, until you're good enough, I'm not going to use you. This is God saying, get the junk out of you so I can flow through you. Okay? That's what, this is, that's what consecration's about. We need a time in our life every day that we clean up. The best illustration of this, I think, is John 13, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. 
He was teaching them that there was something for them that he had to do every day, or that he had to do for them. And Peter even stood up against it. He said, Lord, you can't wash my feet. He thought he was being humble and putting himself under Jesus, but Jesus corrected him. He said, if, you, if I don't wash your feet, you're not one of mine. What was the point of the foot washing? It was to show us that we need Jesus to clean us up as we trudge through this miry life. I say we need to do it every day. We need time every day to go before God and come clean. What does that mean? It's about repentance. What is repentance about? Repentance is about recognizing that there's junk in my life and it is junk. It is slowing me down, it's weighing me down, and it's keeping me from following Christ. It's keeping me from joy, it's keeping me from peace. It's destroying me. Sin destroys us. I hate sin. I hate this stuff. It's the cause of disease. It's the cause of broken marriages. It's the cause of all the conflict, the racism, the hate in our nation today. It's all rooted in sin. So if I walk through my life and I have these pet little sins that I want to hang on to, I am basically cohorting, cohort, whatever, unioning with the enemy. Sorry about that. <sighs> there was a word there. I never found it. Just work with me. Sin makes us dirty, it makes us sick, it makes us deaf, it makes us mute, it silences our voice. Get rid of it. Here's the thing. Jesus paid for it. He's paid for it. Under the blood. This isn't a matter of, I mean, I think there are good times that we need to have seasons of repentance where we connect with the great cost of our sin. Don't misunderstand me. But it's simply a matter of saying, God... There's this thing in my life, and it's wrong. I confess it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is just. He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to live clean. So wake up. Clean up. Back up is the next one. Back up. Back in the 90s, we had these things called tape drives dated myself, didn't I? That's okay, I dated myself through high school. I'm used to it. <sighs> that, was a, that was a dad joke right there. That's a dad joke. Classic dad joke. Really bad. So what would happen is, if you had a business that was running on data and all those things, the 90s and the 2000s, they had these tape drives. You'd stick them in, you'd do a backup every day, and you prayed to God that if your system ever failed, that that tape would work, and it never did stupidest thing ever but <clears throat> that was what we had to do we need to back up in our lives we need to do a backup what do i mean god's been good to you we forget that all the time the nation of israel did they forgot that was why most of the jewish tradition traditions existed was so that the nation of israel could remember how good god was to them and so they had all these traditions and these ceremonies and all these kind of things just to remind them, God is good. God loves you. God cares about you. And so we need to have a backup every day. We need to have some time where we thank God, praise God, remember, write some stuff down. God has been good to me. I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Man, when I get out, when I get out of church today, I will eat lunch. I mean, there's no question about it. You can look at me and tell, oh, that man will eat lunch. Children may go hungry, but he will eat. <laughs> I mean, what an awesome place, what an awesome opportunity, though, to live in a place where that's even possible, you know? I have an amazing wife. She puts up with me like nobody else. She's, she's nuts. She is nuts. She's amazing. She is. She thinks I'm handsome. She tells me that. I'm like, I don't know. I think she needs new glasses, but I'm not getting them. <laughs> I am not getting her new glasses. I am blessed, man. And so are you. And we need to be a people of blessing. To share the blessing. Share the testimony. I tell you what, I got to confess, man. I've been a Christian a long time, and I've been a lot of Christian woe is me and pity us meetings. You have too, I could tell. We should be the most joyful people on the earth because not only are we blessed in the ways that we are in our own community, 
But when we get out of here, heaven begins. We are blessed. We got we to gotta back up every day and say, thank you, God. Then we need to sync up every day. What do I mean by that? Everybody knows about syncing nowadays. You're syncing your phone. We need to do that with God. We need to get in sync with our Father. That's what Jesus did with his prayer time. It was getting on God's page. Getting on God's page. God wants to, he wants to do things in the world. He wants to bless this community. I love this community. I love Rock Springs. Do you love Rock Springs? This is a great place to live if you can get past the wind <laughs> and the winter and the road construction. <laughs> I noticed they're closing down every road in town, just like they do every year. I'm like, for three months we have to figure out how to get around without roads here. It cracks me up. My, my point is we have to get that in sync with what God's doing. He wants to bless this community. He loves Rock Springs. He loves Green River. He loves the state. And my task each day and your task each day is not to go out and survive. <clears throat> I'm going to say that again. Our task each day is, just, is not just to survive another one. Our task each day is to be looking for what God is up to. I'm going to tell you, that's a fun way to live. It really is. It's fun. You'll meet people you never thought you'd meet. You'll meet other Christians, and they will feed your soul. You'll meet people who are in need. You'll get opportunities to talk, to pray, to help somebody. All you got to do, sync up with your father and walk out in that world going, God's up something today, and I'm going to get in the middle of it. <laughs> Doesn't sound like fun? See, this new life's exciting. These people who have this idea of church that it's all, hello, brother, they don't go to our church. <laughs> I might be having a little more fun than I should. <laughs> we got to wake up, and then we got to stand up. Now here's, this is exciting to me. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul makes this awesome. I'll just read it. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Pause. Be strong in the Lord. Not strong in money, not strong in possessions, not strong in relationships. Fill in your blank. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. We need to stand up. Any gamers in the room? Hey, that's right. I forgot. They're not owning it. <laughs> They're just, no, gaming is frowned on in the church today. <laughs> we, we don't, we're not going to raise our hands for that one. <laughs> well, gamers, I might need your help here. We need to stand up. We need to sign on to the battle. First thing we need to do. We've got to sign into some kind of site or something to get ready to play. We've got to sign on every day. What does that mean? Guys, ladies. Boys, girls, you're in a fight every morning. If you don't sign on, you won't realize you're in a fight. You might get out of bed, take your shower, head off to school, to work, to whatever you do, and on your way, you might think, um dee dum dee dum it's just a normal day. There is no normal day in the kingdom. No normal day when darkness and light are, in cont are contesting each other, fighting each other. No normal day when you're following God around going, where are you working? I'm going to jump in the middle of that. There's no normal day. So you've got to wake up and fight in this thing. If Christians began to see that we are in a fight, that would change everything. This isn't middle class America with a little church on the side. Okay? This is a war. And you're in the middle of it. And there's an enemy. He wants your kids. He wants your wife. He wants your marriage. He wants your husband. He wants your money. He wants every blessing you have. He wants your country. He wants your freedom. He wants it all. So wake up in a fight every day. But don't wake up mad. <laughs> Michael, you just look mad. It's a fight you've already won. It's a fight you've already won. The Bible says in Corinthians that Jesus Christ triumphed over the, over the enemy. Triumphed. Do you know what that means? Triumphed. It doesn't mean he won the battle. Triumph is total annihilation of the enemy. 
triumph in Rome, the picture that Paul was drawing off of, the triumph, the, the triumph of Rome, was when the commander of the Roman army came back, and he was in a chariot, and he was dragging his enemies behind him, naked and beaten. And that's exactly what Paul says in, in Corinthians about Jesus' victory over Satan. So I want you to realize that tomorrow when the enemy starts lying at you, or this afternoon, and he is going to lie at you, we'll talk about that in just a minute, as he's lying at you, the truth is that rascal is naked and humiliated, being dragged behind the, the, the uh, leadership of Christ, the victory of Christ. I keep losing words today. And so he is overwhelmed. So... We should log on every day, sign on to the battle, realize we're in it, and we should make the devil pay. We should. I just read this morning the suicide statistics. I did not realize Wyoming has led the country in suicide rates for years. I'm mean, number one in the United States. You know who's the lowest? New Jersey. What? I don't know. That's just weird. Anyway, so how are we going to do this? Well, I sign on to the battle, but don't go into this thing unprepared. So Paul tells us to suit up. And that's where we go to in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting in about verse 13. Therefore, Put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of battle, and then after the battle, you will be standing firm. So, man, you gamers in the room, you know if you're going to play a game, you've got to have the equipment, right? The weapons. You've got to suit up to get in this thing. And that's no different in the kingdom of God. God wants us to prepare for this battle, to get the armor on, get ready to fight this thing. So Paul lists these things. Let me read verse 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In verse 18, excuse me, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. So, there's this armor that Paul talks about. And it's all a metaphor for different things. The first is the belt of truth, all right? So in the uh, so Paul is drawing an analogy from the Roman soldier, and the belt was kind of like the Roman soldier's backpack. That's how we we think of it today. But his belt would hold extra weapons. It would hold his armor in place. It was the foundation for his armor, as truth is the foundation for your life. It's the foundation for your identity. It's the foundation for who you are and what God wants to do in you and through you. And so Paul says, suit up today, get the truth around you. Guys, we need to embrace that teaching. We need to learn what is truth and what is true in our lives. We need to learn who we are in Christ. We need to learn who Christ is in us, who God wants to be through us. We need to learn his word, his truth, his doctrines. We also need to learn the practical applications of those doctrines. And I'll just throw this out here. I am a huge fan. I believe Christianity is lived, not just known. I think if there is a gap between intellect and action, then that fault is on us. If you are going to live this exciting new life in Christ, it's the stuff you've learned you have to do. Does that make sense? Do stuff because God has done it. So based on this truth. So everything's founded on truth. Then he talks about the armor, body armor is what the New Living talks about. The breastplate of righteousness is what the older translations talk about. Basically, it was founded on the belt. The belt held it in place, so it was founded on truth. But it protected the core of the body, the, the place that if you get hurt, you're probably going to die. All right? And so what was it, though? It was the breastplate of what? Righteousness. What is righteousness? It's doing the right thing. It's doing what Jesus would do, would do if he were in your situation. And so we need to live out righteousness. Now, I think there's an easy way to live out righteousness, and it's simply this. Pursue Jesus. I'd say the, the hardest way to live out righteousness is to resist sin. The Bible says to resist the devil. That's good. But I'm just saying as long as you're trying to fight sin, you're not pursuing Jesus. Jesus already beat sin. Pursue Jesus. But we live in his righteousness. It's imputed. But that does not mean does not mean that I get to go through life and live in all kinds of sin. 
Because sin makes me dirty. Sin makes me dumb. Sin makes me mute. Sin takes away my power. I just feel like someone just thought of a sin in their life that is stripping the power out of their life. So, hey, own it. Let Jesus wash it away. You're done. There's no need for guilt. There's always need for repentance. Guilt should just alert us to the need for repentance and then be done with. If you're living under guilt, you're not living on the gospel. The good news, okay? So just let it go. Let Jesus wash that thing away and take it out of your life. Belt of truth, armor of righteousness. And righteousness is critical to this battle. The boots of peace. The Roman soldiers, actually one of their secrets to their victories was their boots. They were the first army to have actual boots. They would drive nails through them so they could hold their ground. And so Paul tells us to have the boots of the gospel of peace. So think about this. You're in a war, but you're fighting from a position, a founding of peace. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? Doesn't that sound like totally in opposition, but you are standing and fighting from a position of peace. You are at peace with God, and you're fighting for the peace of the people that you know and love and work with. You're fighting for the peace of Rock Springs. You're founded in that. So, those, so there, there you have the belt, the breastplate, or the body armor. You have the boots, and then he moves into the S's, so three B's and three S's, okay? They don't quite work this way, but bear with me, okay? Then he moves into the shield of faith. And most people believe he's referring to the Roman shield versus the Greek shield. What's the difference? The Greek shield was like a giant dinner plate on your arm. And the Roman shield would protect you from chin to knees. And they were designed to work with your squad. So they would interlock with each other. And so the funny thing about the shield, you think of a shield, you think of a defensive weapon, but... In the Roman army, the shield was a defensive weapon used as an offensive tactic. What they would do is they would gather together 10, 15 men. They would link their shields, and then they would attack the walls of a city, and the fiery arrows coming from above couldn't hit them because they were all shielding each other. Think about that in a Christian context. Satan's always shooting these fiery darts at you. They're lies. Just another lie and another lie and another lie. And yeah, you got your shield in life. You believe. You trust Jesus Christ. But you need a squad around you, don't you? Sometimes don't you need someone in your life to come up and say, hey man, have faith. Isn't that what Paul did for Timothy and Titus? Believe. Stay strong in the Lord. Have courage. This is why we come together, guys. Not to just listen to the crazy guy. But to actually come together and say, hey, have faith. This matters. This is important. We can do this together because Christ empowers us. We can change things. So we've got the shield of faith, keeping those doubts at bay, those lies at bay. The helmet of salvation, another Roman thing. I mean, Romans actually made advanced helmets. They were lined, padded. Some of them were even custom fitted. So just think about it. For salvation, he says, put on Salvation like a helmet. Salvation like a helmet. Do you have any idea how awesome your salvation is? He's kind of saying, get your head in your salvation and enjoy that. Enjoy and know and wrap your mind and your heart around how awesome it is to be saved. Man. We don't. We always want answers. Why did God do this? Why did this happen? We really, God gave this to me for a funeral a couple weeks ago. We really need to stop living life like it's a classroom. And we're learning for the final exam that if we pass, we get to go to heaven. That is not what life is. That is not what salvation is. The gospel is is not a classroom thing. Jesus is a savior. I am not in a classroom trying to learn all the questions for the test, I am drowning in an ocean trying not to die. That's what I am. And Jesus offers salvation to men and women who don't want to die. Does that make sense? Salvation is awesome. And very visceral, obviously. So, then we move into the sword. So we had the shield, 
We had the salvation. I stretched that a little bit. And now we have the sword, which is the word of the Lord. And, and of course, I have to give you Hebrews 4.12 because I, I wouldn't. Apparently, you're not welcome anymore. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Wyoming wind. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest to its sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The Word of God is powerful, guys. Michael alluded to it. I can't remember one of the prayers this morning talked about the power of God's Word. And I, I know how intimidating it is nowadays. I mean, I've shared the gospel t- with people that don't believe the Bible. Here's what I have learned. I have literally, I learned this through Share Jesus Without Fear. I don't use it all the time, but it's one of my favorites. And Share Jesus Without Fear, it's a method that came out from the Southern Baptist a few years ago, but it's a simple method of just, rather than trying to convince someone of the gospel or teach the four spiritual laws, they just ask people to read a verse and tell them what they think it means. It's pretty awesome. I like it because it puts someone in direct conflict with God's word. I mean, conflict. They have to, they have to deal with what God's word says. And here's what I've seen over the years. I've seen people like, I don't believe the Bible. And then when you started, when you asked them to read it, they would forget they don't believe it. I have seen that time and time again. I have seen times where I've been able to quote a scripture that was appropriate to a situation that would have an impact on a life who did not believe in the value of the scriptures. God's word is powerful. It will not return void. Jesus used it against the devil. The devil tried to use it against Jesus. But he used it wrong, so let that be a lesson. God's word is powerful, so powerful, that it doesn't matter if someone believes it or not. God's word can shatter unbelief. And the last thing that Peter, Paul mentions, I'm sorry, all these P's, is prayer again. So, well, Michael, you already talked about prayer. Well, I don't know, I kind of, I'm sorry, this is going to sound a little weird. And, you know, I saw Star Wars when I was a kid, so maybe it comes from there. But Paul talks about praying, and he talks about the armor, the belt, and the breastplate, and the boots, and the shield, and the sword, and the salvation. And he says, pray. Pray in the Spirit at all times. And as I was reading that, I'm going, you know, prayer, it's kind of like a force field. Doesn't prayer kind of put you in a whole new atmosphere? I mean, isn't prayer kind of like pulling this protective sphere right out of the throne room and putting it around yourself? Walking through life in prayer, the enemy trying to get through that force field, get through that faith, get through that peace, get through that righteousness. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 10.3. He said, we are human, but we don't play fair. We don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly ones, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We don't play fair. We play with the power of God. We've already won. Now, I should just warn you, the enemy does have a weapon. One, his whole arsenal, one weapon, he's really good at it. He lies. Lies, 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 all the time. Telling you God's word isn't true. Telling you culture is more important than scripture. Telling your experience should dictate what God's word means versus God's word meaning dictating how your life goes. He's always lying. And if you believe him on any given day, he will take you out for that day. He can take things from you with his lies. But you have to realize he's humiliated. He's being pulled behind Jesus' chariot. He's screaming from a line of the defeated. It's only lies. And in the end, and even now, he is already lost. So we shouldn't believe those lies. We should wake up every day, game on. Sink up, suit up. And get in this thing. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, even the chubby people, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. And he says, I run with purpose in every step. What's that going to look like? What's it going to look like for you? Now, this is the question you're going to answer. What's it going to look like for you to leave this place today and apply this? 
to sign on and suit up and game on today, this afternoon, tomorrow morning. What's that going to look like in your life? It's going to start personal. You cannot pour into your family, pour into your business, pour into other people until you get in a place where Jesus pours into you. You can't move from a position of bankruptcy, okay? So you got to work on you first. And you can do this simultaneously, but man, we have sins in our lives. Things that shouldn't be there. we got problems in our marriages, problems with our kids. I mean, I could list sins for a while, but if I do that, then you'll like get all defensive on me. I kind of want to do it. <laughs> Just so you know what I'm talking about. My point is, you probably know right now what you need to beat. Probably know. So repent. Take that on first. Go to God, Jesus. I'm a mess. I did this, I did that, I didn't do whatever. There's sins of omission, stuff we don't do we should, sins of commission, things that we shouldn't do that we do. There's distractions, there's all kinds of things. Lord, get these out of my, start there. Get clean. And then begin to engage and move forward from there. Work in your family. Begin to love your family. Guys, guys, if I can talk to you men for just a second. Lead your family. How do you do that? Man. You start by really, 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 really loving your wife. Let me teach you how to, let me tell you a little bit about leading. It's something, an epiphany God gave me not too, not too long ago that just was so big for me. I think most people think the leader is like the most competent person, the one who knows the most, and all the guys working out of these corporations or in these different places, they're going, whatever, my boss knows nothing. He has no idea what I do. How does that work? How do you end up in a position in your work, in your work situation, your career, where you have people over you that are your leader, but they don't know anything that you're supposed to do? Is that right or is that wrong? Well, let me tell you what a leader really does. It's not the leader's job to know everything. So men, you don't have to, in order to be the spiritual leader of your home, you don't have to be the smartest dude scripturally in your house. You don't. What does a leader really do? I'll tell you what a leader does. A leader equips those that are in their responsibility for success. That's what a good leader does. He doesn't claim all the success. Well, some of them do, but they're not good leaders. But he equips those. So, man, how can you lead your wives and stand up and be the man in your home that you want to be? Start equipping your family for success. You don't have to know everything, but you can find out what you need to to help your wife get free, to help your kids mature. It's all about equipping, making success possible. Does that make sense? If you're mad, don't tell me about it. I love you. I just don't want to know. So <clears throat> we need to move in these areas of our life. It might look like stepping into what's happening in our community. I was talking um, with Miss Linda Cornell this week. I brought you in the sermon, Miss Linda. She tries to get in anyway, so I'm just making it easy. She works on a board for the Salvation Army. And they need board members, and that group, that group in this community does so much to make sure that needs get met. Without the Salvation Army, this community is going to be in, in trouble. Okay, And so she needs help there. I'm just saying, there are places in our community... This is why we at Ordinary Faith don't try and start a bunch of ministries on our own. We don't want to be outside of the community throwing gifts in. We want to be in the middle of it, loving people who are there. Does that make sense? That's what we want to do. And so our community needs us. Salvation Army needs us. There's all different types of things that need us. And I know sometimes you encounter moral dilemmas, okay? And I just want to remind you that when you encounter a moral dilemma in a community, in a situation in our community, it's because God wants Jesus in the middle of that moral dilemma. You understand? We need to stop pulling out of the moral dilemmas and enter into them with the love of Christ and loving people and giving truth in every way that we can. And so... There are things you can do. You could start a business that uses profits to support ministry. 
You could start a business that's entire foundational purpose is to bring Christ into the marketplace. This is a growing thing throughout the world. I'm really excited about it. The church needs to be in the business world because the gospel needs to be there. And so we can do that. And so people are doing it. You can be like April and take a mission trip. Isn't that a little crazy? She didn't do this on purpose. God called her, woke her up said, I want you in the fight, and gave her an impossible situation, one that broke her heart the second she heard about it. And now she's getting that message out in our community. By the way, the county's come along beside her. There are human traffic awareness groups popping up right now in Sweetwater County because God woke up April Marino. That's awesome. Isn't it exciting to be a child of God? Our world needs us. We can do stuff about it. We have the power of God in us. I just want to give you one little thing. Ministry is awesome, but it's also very hard. And here's why it's hard. I heard a story many years ago about a beach somewhere in the country that a tide had come in too high or there was a storm and it washed in thousands and thousands of starfish. And this uh, elderly gentleman, gentleman was out one day walking along the beach, and he saw a little boy on the shore. And I mean, the boy is like ankle deep in starfish as far as the eye could see. And the little boy's picking up his starfish as they're drying out in the sun. They're not gone yet, and he just picks up a starfish and flings it out in the ocean. The old man just yells at him and says, Son, you're not going to make any difference in that. There's too many. And the boy yelled back as he picked up another starfish and flung it out in the sea. Made a difference to that one. <laughs> in life, you do ministry. You don't do ministry because the community needs ministry. You do ministry because the one who was poured out for you wants you to be poured out for him. That's why you do ministry. Does that make sense? This is for Jesus. And every homeless person you help, every mouth you feed, every person that gets delivered from human trafficking, every marriage that gets held together, every child that gets through a crisis situation, every suicide that's prevented, the list goes on. Everyone is simply a ministry to Jesus. And so I can't sit here and worry and fret and give up because there are tens of thousands I can't help. Ministry isn't about the tens of thousands that I can't personally help. Ministry is about trusting God that he's going to send some others to help them. And I make the difference to the ones I can. Does that make sense? And so, guys, we've finished up this series, The New Normal. And I've challenged you, I think. I've called you. My goal from the beginning was to call you out of a Christianity that merely had Jesus as an accessory into an active faith that has practical implications on any ordinary Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Saturday. I've asked you, I've asked you, you're empowered to make a difference. And you are. And now you have a job. Any message you get, you're responsible for. You're welcome. <laughs> and here's what your job is. Are you ready? Your job is to try. It's to try. You know, I'm not a good guitarist now, but when I first started, I was really bad. And I remember trying to play, and I, I just wanted to worship, you know. My fingers would kill me. I'd whine. I sang the same song a third of the way through a hundred times. Drove my wife insane. I was really bad. But I kept trying. And I kept trying. And eventually that trying became for me an opportunity to worship anytime I can. Guys, just try. And don't quit trying. Don't quit. Just try to touch a life. Try to pray for somebody. Try to put that marriage back together. Try to love on those kids. Try to give them what they need. Keep trying because... Faith without trying is dead. To requote James. So try. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray this day 
for the power of God to drive fear out of our hearts. Our community needs us. Addiction, pornography, human trafficking, suicide, the worst diseases and blights on humanity are right here in our community. But in the midst of this community are also amazing people. So many who love God, so many who love others. I pray, Lord, that the faith and the goodness of God would drive fear out of us, drive sloth out of us. Challenge us to stand up and believe, to try. I thank you that we are so blessed. We get so many opportunities to do so many things that so few get. But Lord, people need us. People need you.